I'll be preaching from the Old Testament today, so we'll start with the New Testament reading, and that is from the book of Acts. We're talking about what it, what it is to, to relent and repent and rejoice. Before we can do that in the first place, we have to become Christians. And here's a passage where uh, there's a lot of persecution going on, and in the midst of that, there's redemption and salvation. So from Acts 16, starting at 22... This crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in an inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to commit suicide, about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted out, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Well, the jailer called for lights, he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then ordered them out and, and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household were baptized the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. That early, the repentance, the redemption. But then what happens to a Christian, someone who's fearing God, after that moment when things don't always go as they should? From the text today in the 32nd Psalm, we have a, a psalm from David. Uh, this was believed after that he had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah murdered. And then Nathan, the prophet, called him on it and he confessed. This is the psalm that we believe came out of that experience. Psalm 32. David wrote, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's preaching passage comes from the Old Testament, as I just said. It's a section of the Scripture called the Wisdom Literature. And this particular section is the Psalms. Now, if you didn't know this, the Psalms are basically songs. They were the old Jewish hymnal, basically. As we're reading through the Psalms, by the way, if you're reading through the Scriptures with me, today's reading is, is one of these two Psalms. So you got your one part of your readings already done. What we're basically reading now is a hymn book. We're reading the words that people wrote about God. 
we see God revealed in him sometimes, but it is not necessarily God speaking to us as much as an author relating his experience. It's poetry. Something to remember about prophecy and the Psalms. It's all poetry. Poetry is not meant to be taken literally for the most part. It's meant to be evoking an emotion, a feeling. How does this, make, how does this move you when you hear this poetry? And a lot of people say, well, you know, especially guys, oh, I'm not into poetry. It's kind of like sissy stuff. I don't know. Any song you like and you repeat, it's poetry set to music. And how powerful that is that we can probably go back to our high school days and the favorite song you remember at the, at the band when you had your girlfriend. You can sing most of those words. It's poetry combined with music. It has that influence, that power on us. I wish I could tell you what the original psalm sounded like. We have no clue. We have the words, but how they played and what they did is completely lost to us. We do know that they had timbrels and cymbals and trumpets and lutes. and fl- we, They had a great variety of music, and my guess is they used it quite extensively. What happened, though, is we lost all of that, and all we had was the words. They were singing the psalms. Have you, have many people have heard of Psalter? Most of you should. Yeah, Psalter. It's those psalms set to some kind of music, but usually it's very dull, I, I would have to say out of the monastery period where they started singing the psalms, it's kind of like the chanting sound. And that's what they were doing for for hundreds of years, over a thousand years. They would sing the Psalter, but it was kind of a sing-songy way. And after a while, there's a guy named Isaac Watts. You may have heard of him before. He was in the 1700s, way back even before the Revolutionary War. He says, Dad, I don't like this thing. It's it's lousy. It's just it's boring. You know what his dad said? We've always done it this way. Tough. No, he didn't. The son said, Dad, I don't like this music. So the dad said, you think you can do better, Isaac? Go ahead. So he wrote a hymn. And on the Sunday that his church sang it, they all said, Isaac, that was great. Do some more. And so he did. And Isaac Watts started what we now have as our modern hymnal. The way of singing with the four-part harmony and the working through that, whole different change. And that was the standard from the 1700s on until about the 19-somethings when kids started saying, you know what, I don't like that music. It's boring. I don't like it. And some of the fathers said, you think you can do better? Go ahead. And we got stuff like Days of Elijah, the new generation of music that came out of that. It's great. I think it's wonderful how we move through things and and allowing things to speak to us. Now, Acts talked about what must I do to be saved. That's a million-dollar question. Because without that, forget everything else. I don't care how righteous you think you are. If you are not saved, if you don't have that power in you, then you're not even a square one yet. But what happens to a lot of us is somewhere along the line, most of us, In our childhood, early years, we've accepted Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved was answered. And then we get on with our lives and things happen. We wind up more like the psalmist than the jailer. Because we've already known that salvation. We have that. But something went wrong. We messed up. And that's where the psalm comes in. What must I do when, not if. (laughs) Anybody here is saying, if I mess up, then... Get your blinders off. What are you going to do when you mess up? Relent, repent, rejoice. Words we don't use a whole lot these days, so let me back up a little bit. Relent, according to Webster, means to become less severe or to let up, to slacken or to yield. And I think that's the appropriate one. Another way of saying it is get your foot off the gas. When you relent, You've been going in one direction and you're going in the wrong direction. You realize that. So just get off the gas a minute. Ease up. Slack up a little bit. The next thing is repent. To turn from sin. And dedicate oneself to amendments. So first you get off the gas, back up a little bit, and then turn around. Do that U-turn is the repenting. And the last part, we forget about this so many times. Rejoice. It's one of the R words I was hoping you'd bring in there. Rejoice. To feel joy and great delight. 
because you're going the right way now. You realize whatever it was, sexually, financially, physically, pride, whatever it was, you're going down the wrong way. First off, something's wrong here. Ease off the gas. And then turn it around and celebrate. Rejoice that you're going the right way. We see this with David in his text. And as we move through that, if you're still in your Bible, Psalm 32, first off, it's with a praise to God. He's blessing those who are transgressions. He knows he's been receiving this promise. Now he starts off by celebrating. But then verse 3 and 4, that's the conviction. He kept silent. His bones wasted away. And say it's conviction, not condemnation. Paul's already told of us. Those of us who are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. There's no condemnation. But there is conviction. When you look in the mirror and you realize, you know, I really... I think God doesn't want me doing this. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you that you're not on the right path. It's time to turn it around. His hand was heavy on me. His strength was sapped. Verse 5, then I acknowledge my sin. It's the confession. Repenting. I'll confess you forgave my sins. The result in verse 6 and (laughs) 7, you're my hiding place. You'll protect me from trouble. There's that confidence again. Surrounds me with songs of deliverance. And verse 8, by the way, if you didn't catch that, I paused there because now the, the author's changing voice. This has been him talking and, and making a confession. Verses 8 and 9 are God's response. This is God talking to David. I, God, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you will go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. It's not the rod. It's not the whip. It's just my eyes. Just watch me. I'll tell you which way to go. You just keep your eyes on me, and I'll tell you which way you ought to be going. Don't be like the horse and the mule. I think the contrast between that, the horse will charge its head on. The horse will just take off and run like crazy. The mule often has to be coaxed to do what you want it to do. So don't be like that. They need a bridle and a bit to control them. Be controlled by the eyes of God. Keep your eyes on God and he will direct you as a loving father would. And then the last part, <laughs> there's a warning for those who are evil, but verse 11, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all who are upright. When's the last time you just felt like rejoicing on a Wednesday afternoon? Now, this comes to the so what part. If, if you're new to my sermons, I always try to, after I explain the text and you have this information, that could be a teaching class, a Sunday school class, but so what? Now you know about the jailer and that thing, but most everybody in here has had that salvation experience. You've heard David's thing after his confession, and you're better informed about the psalm. But so what? What does that have to do in your life? Are you rejoicing in Christ? Are you rejoicing in your salvation and your forgiveness? Is that the state of your heart? Let me ask you another way, if you're not sure how to answer that. Would your behavior convince a non-church person to come to your church? You're out in the world doing your thing. Gas prices go up. There's a long waiting line to shopping, wherever. All these things. Your behavior, that sense of rejoicing in the Lord, is it there? If someone sees you, go, you know what? I, I don't know what's going on with you, but I want some of that. I don't know how it is you get through. I know some of the problems in your life, and you've got this joy about you. You've got something going on that I'm curious. How can I be like that? Would your behavior convince a non-believer to come to your church? Warren Wiersbe is a commentator I like to go to sometimes. He says, nothing shuts a Christian's mouth like unconfessed sin. I think I ought to say something to him. Well, you know, I'm kind of doing that myself. Maybe I ought to keep my mouth shut. Nothing shuts the mouth of a Christian like unconfessed sin. Is something keeping you from rejoicing in the forgiveness that God's given you? 
Is there something keeping your mouth shut that you need to repent from? And remember, repentance is not just regretting. I may regret something that I feel I need to do to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's not repentance. I know that line, it says, uh, hurting you is the last thing on my list, but it's still on the list. So I'm sorry about that. I regret having to do this, but that's not repentance. Repentance is making a change. It involves intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect, change the mind, it's a desire to stop. I'm going to pick on speeding because I have a lead foot sometimes. It's not just, gee, I'm sorry that I exceeded the speed limit. I'm sorry I got caught and have to pay the fine. It's, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be that guy that gets pulled over because I'm going too fast. It's not just regretting it. It's, re- it's changing the way I think. So it takes a little bit longer to get there. Big deal. I feel better not having to worry about that. You see, it's an intellectual thing. You have to think of it. It's an emotional thing. Now, there's godly sorrow and there's worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow about something brings on grief and depression. Oh, what I'm doing is so terrible. That's the downs. That's worldly. Now, we're talking about godly sorrow. It's a powerful impulse. There's a genuine turning going on in there. That emotion as you're coming before God on that. It's not the depression as much as a realization and empowerment by the Holy Spirit to do something about the situation. And the will. There's an action involved. Love's an action verb. It requires something of you. Not a modern Christianity. Today's Christianity in America is all about the acts thing. I listen to music on the radio, the Christian music. It's all seeker service stuff. It's all about coming to Jesus and being forgiven of your sins. There's very little I find on the radio that talks about the David thing. God, I've been a Christian a long time and I messed up. Thank you, God, for hearing me again and relieving my sin. We are all about come to Jesus. We love to sing just as I am, and we think it ends there. Just come to Jesus and it's all good. What we lose so many times is it has to change your life. We don't want to do that. We want to come to Jesus and be declared safe and go into heaven, but not change our lives. Don't, give me a, don't tell me to give up a lifestyle. Don't make me change something that I enjoy doing, even if the Bible says it's wrong. I just believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven. That's not the full Scripture. There involves that repentance, that reformation, that change that happens from the inside, and it shows on the outside. And when it happens, there's a joy behind that. Is anything holding you or me or us back from rejoicing? Is there anything that's holding us from being that person in the world that has people looking at him because everybody else is grumbling and complaining about the heat and the aches and the pains and the internal problems we got, and you're not? (laughs) <laughs> and you're saying, you know, I really, it's a great day to be alive. What's keeping us from rejoicing the way David did in that psalm? It was even more important than that. What will you do with this message? Tuck it away? Start thinking about lunch? Or will you do something with this call to repent and rejoice?